hi guys welcome back to my channel my name is shalom umo if this is the first time you are meeting me this is shalom reacts and over here we do amazing movie reviews to music reactions and of course everything nice interesting and just about spicy i'm back again with another interesting interview and this one is with michaela montgomery america first works and she supports trump in this particular interview let's hear what she has to say if you're excited about this video make sure you smash the like button make sure you subscribe to this channel and of course turn on your notification bells to get notified every single time i drop a new video without further ado let's dig right in washington journal continues welcome back we're joined now by michaela montgomery she's the georgia coordinator for fulton county for america first works She's also the founder of Conserve the Culture. Michaela, welcome to the program. Hello, hello. Thank you guys for having me. You introduced former President Trump at uh, his recent rally in Atlanta. How did that come about? How did hmm. you meet him? So I actually met him back in April at the Chick-fil-A that, you know, was a viral moment now. Um, and I've been in contact with the team ever since then. Uh, President Trump actually invited me and all the HBCU students to have a private dinner with him at Mar-a-Lago. And, you know, I saw him when he went to Detroit for the rallies. Um, again, I'm a member of Blexit, so uh, I was there for the Turning Point, People's Convention, things like that. And so when I heard he was coming to Atlanta, I just reached out to the team and I said, what are the odds that I can speak on Saturday? And they said yes. And I made that request on a Wednesday night. And nobody, you know, told me what to say. Nobody said, make sure you do this. Nobody made any edits wow. to my speech. They literally let me write it out. I submitted it and said, this is what I'd like to say. They said, all right, try to keep it under five minutes. That's probably the only rule that I broke, but I don't think anybody was upset about it. You, uh, you're very active in politics, obviously. Can you tell us how you got involved and why? Um, yes, so I actually moved to Atlanta, Georgia from Las Vegas, Nevada. And just knowing, or not knowing, but observing the starking differences in the quality of education that I saw some of the students receiving, looking at development, specifically urban development, infrastructure, and how people are complaining about the roads. And even now, I've been here 10 years, and people are still complaining about the same roads. Um, I just thought, wow, there must be a way to do something about this other than complaining about it. And um, my senior year of high school is actually when I decided to change my major from pre-law to political science because I knew then that I could really make change being in government. Before I thought that I could make change defending, you know, mm. the defenseless. But I'm like, wow, if I create laws that could help them before they ever, you know, need to be in a courtroom, I think that would be better. And um, I was actually picked up by Miss Vivian Childs and Janelle King. Uh, way back in 2017, Janelle King was working with the GAGOP at the time, let me know that internships were available. I decided to go ahead and take one up. I learned a lot. I met some amazing people, and I've just been doing the work ever since then. So you're the wow. uh, organizer in Fulton County, Georgia, for America First Works. Yes. Tell us what that is and the um, affiliation very curious. with the Trump campaign. So as you know, the Trump campaign has shouted out America First Works, America First Policy Institute, the entire America First family tree. Um, we're a big, I guess, I wouldn't say think tank, but a lot of the outsourcing in regards to the engagement, the outreach, the mobilization of voters and volunteers would all come through America First. We also do a lot of events and things like that. So my role specifically would be to throw events, to encourage people to not just pay attention to the election, mm -hmm. but get involved with the campaign, to encourage their friends to vote, to come up with a voting plan on election day or during early voting, all of those things. So at America First Works specifically, I am in charge of volunteer recruitment, coordination, and mobilization. And how is it funded? Um, it's a PAC, so I imagine that the money comes from donors. Donors who support any of our pillars, whether that be for education, whether that be gun rights, whether that be uh, pro-life enthusiasts, it would come from donors. And why do you personally support former President Trump? I personally support President Trump due to my personal beliefs. So as a former foster child, I really love family 
And I don't think that just because things didn't work out with my birth parents, that that meant that I didn't deserve to be here. So that turned me kind of into a pro-lifer. I'm not the type to demonize people for the decisions that they decide to make. But me personally, if I'm going to vote for my personal views, I'm going to align myself with a pro-life candidate. Additionally, I am a mother now myself. So I do pay a lot of attention to the education that my child is receiving. Um, and again, when I moved out here, I noticed the differences between the standards of education in Nevada and the standards of education out here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I didn't like how I came here and I felt like not necessarily that I was smarter than everybody else, but I just felt like I was equipped with a better education than a lot of other people. And I don't know whether that be the allocation of resources. I don't know if it had something to do with property taxes. I don't know if maybe I just got lucky and had amazing teachers all throughout mm -hmm. my life. But as a mother now, I think it's very apparent, uh, important that parents have a say-so in their child's education and that parents can remain hands-on. For instance, I don't believe that there's 53 genders and I refuse to allow my child to sit in a classroom room in which they're going to tell her okay. that that is what is true and she will be tested on said thing and possibly failed if I tell her that there's only two genders and I don't care what the teacher says. Um, lastly, as a single mother, as a woman who, you know, I think I'm gorgeous. So um, just being able to protect myself, having my second amendment rights protected regardless, I do not want to live in a world in which your personal firearms are expected to be surrendered because in a world like that, the only people who have guns are criminals and law enforcement. So if someone were to break into my home, which actually has happened to me recently, I wouldn't be able to protect myself. And whoever was breaking into my home would also know that. And the person breaking into my home would probably be equipped with a weapon because just like drugs, if people want something that's illegal, they're going to get it. Um, and so those are my three main reasons. Additionally, I have a brother that was formerly incarcerated, so he is now a returning citizen. Mm. And I think it's unfair that migrants can commit a crime by illegally migrating over here and they get rewarded with the same resources that my brother would be turned down for. So my brother cannot get food stamps. My brother cannot apply for a luxury apartment. My brother cannot just go out for a corporate job without knowing somebody who knows somebody. Yet a migrant can come over here illegally and be awarded food stamps, be awarded housing assistance, be granted the opportunity to uh, pursue a higher education. All of these things, yet my brother who was born here here, bred here, when he worked, paid taxes here, he can't get those things, but a migrant can. So when I look specifically at policy and my personal experience, everything that I would want aligns with what I see on the Trump side. Whoa. As touching as her story is, our journey, it's <laughs> very remarkable what she has done, you know, with America, um, America's first work. And... I just, I, I'm now beginning to see the light in this Trump's camp, like following up her story and everything she has stated so far. First of all, she's a pro-lifer. Secondly, she's saying that Trump's policies or, you know, aligns with what, with her personal beliefs. And that is why she's supporting Trump. Now, this is, I'm, first of all, I'm very amazed seeing a black person in Trump's camp. Usually, I, I think that this um, political race it's more about skin color and you know all of that but now i am seeing the light like i'm seeing a black person supporting trump that has given me a shift i'm like okay so now this is not just about personal gains this is not this whole election process is not just about oh you're black and i'm white because usually it is okay or it's expected that it's a black person that will support kamala harris you know but this other way it's there's something it has done to my mindset right now and i'm kind of beginning to see why you no know, people are uh you know going into trump's camp you know following up this story and everything and speaking about this illegal migrants case that was a, a video i made sometime you know now in comparison with this her story i can imagine somebody who was bred who was brought up who was born in america but simply because maybe he went to prison for something and now he's out. Certain rights of his has been constrained. There are certain things he cannot get to do anymore. But meanwhile, somebody who migrates or, or who comes to the United States of America illegally, you know, has access to these rights. So I can imagine how, how this other person, you know, 
we feel cheated you know about all of these things wow michaela montgomery you can do so our lines are republicans 202-748-8001 democrats 202-748-8000 and independents 202-748-8002 and uh, Kayla, you founded a group called Conserve the Culture. What is mm. that about? I so really want to find out about this thing. It's mainly a mobilization group. So almost a staff, excuse me, almost a staffing company. So I started out as a door-to-door -door canvasser, actually. And um, when doing those projects, the field director would usually be like, do you have any friends that can join you? Can you bring some more people with you tomorrow? And me being a poli-sci major at an HBCU, all I would have to do is go to class and tell people, hey, I'm doing this work for this election. They're going to pay us. Do any of you want to come? And of course, everybody would want to come with me. So I would get everybody to my house. Um, we would wait for the van, the bus, the Uber, whatever, to come pick us up. We would go to the neighborhoods we would canvas those neighborhoods we would go right back to my house which was on campus so okay. everybody would go to their respective dorms afterwards so that was something i started getting calls dar darn near every other week and so i was like hmm this is very interesting and eventually i ended up working for this man named edward muldrow and after mobilizing the team, getting them out there, getting them home, I'm going to pick up the money so that I can compensate the workers. And he gave me a nice little bit on top of what I was supposed to be, what was owed. And I was like, what's this? And he basically let me know, if you recruit, train, mobilize, transport, and pay these people, you are a manager. And it's about time you start carrying yourself as wow. such. And so Conserve the Culture was created from there. <laughs> And now it's primarily not just jobs, but of course I make an effort to make sure they have the opportunity to meet whatever candidate it is that they are working for. I bring them to different events, town halls, so that they can see mm -hmm. their candidate debate or hear their candidate speak on the issues that are important to them. I have really done my best in exposing them to the different sides of politics. So while I may support Trump, I don't expect them all to support Trump because my journey that got me here might be different, different. from theirs. So all I can do is give them the same opportunities that were granted to me and that's let me get you in the room let me allow you to participate in these conversations and let me let you know that you know you do have access to your city councilman to your commissioner to your mayor to your governor things like that you do have a right to speak to them you do have a voice in regards to what your concerns are so I bring my kids everywhere they didn't they haven't only met President Trump they've met presidential candidate or hopeful candidate Robert F. Kennedy as well and if Joe Biden actually cared about the community they would have met him too but he hasn't made himself accessible so with that being said I just do my best to create a new generation of informed voters yes Kayla rocks this way and I'm gonna bring y'all to wherever I'm at so you guys can see why but if you still don't rock with it here's what's going on over here and here's what's going on over there now let's have conversations about what you learned in this room and how it differs from what was said in that room okay. this I think is how we're gonna solve the issue of voter apathy and um, the you know low level how we have high levels of voter registration and low levels of voter turnout so Kayla the uh, Atlanta rally that we were talking about where you introduced uh, former President Trump um, a few days before that he spoke to uh, the National Association of Black Journalists mm -hmm. and he talked about uh, Vice President Harris's racial identity that she had become black mm -hmm. a lot of critics said that that hurt him with black voters what was your reaction? I don't know why it would hurt him with black voters because it seems like black voters are offended by everything except the conditions in which their reality is set. So while we might be offended that a rich white man is questioning the nationality of a quote unquote black woman, that black woman does not claim to be black outside of campaign season. So wow. we saw her be black as she was vying to be VP. The hot sauce on the pork chops, the marching with the band, all of a sudden she's paying attention to her AKA sorority sisters. But then once sworn in office, you didn't see the acknowledgement of her sorority or her HBCU. She didn't wear pink, she didn't wear green, she didn't wear uh, anything HU. She also did not acknowledge the black community while in office. We saw bills signed for Asians. We saw bills passed for migrants, which primarily wow. affects the Hispanic community. We saw bills passed for literally everyone but black Blacks. people. Mm. So for her, additionally, last thing, after she took I see that the oath of office, she went on record to say that she was the first South 
Asian vice president. At no point in time did she promote her blackness. At no point in time does she acknowledge her blackness. At no point in time does she market herself as a black woman. And that was when she was attorney general. That's back when she was DA. That's all the way until she was senator. And of course, as vice president. So the fact that, again, she's using this black card during the election season just so black people will turn out to vote for her. And then she will, if she were to win, she would be in office and then fail those same black people who did everything in their power to get her in. I think that's disgusting. I think that's unfair. And I think that that's why I personally reached out to the Trump campaign and asked if I could speak because I'm like, you guys might be offended when he says it, but what are you going to do when I say it? Because at the end of the day, I am a black woman. I've mm. lived a black life and True. therefore, I pay, and I pay attention to politics. So I was actually excited for her when she ran for president the first time. Just the fact that she was in the race, I was like, okay, HBCUs, do your thing. But she never acknowledged said HBCUs. In the first 100 days of the administration, they cut funding to HBCUs. She did nothing to support the very people that she's now leaning on to win this election. And I wish that those same people would understand that if they were to support her in this election and she does win, we will see nothing but a repeat of the last administration in which black people, the same people that everybody tells when it's time to get elected, will also be the ones that are the first to be forgotten about once they're sworn in. I can imagine how used she feels, how used the black people feel. So, like I said before, initially when I started this video, I said maybe it's all right or it's normal for a black person to support, you know, Kamala Harris, but seeing a black person support Trump, there must be more to it. And now we are beginning to see the different layers of more in quotes. Now. Um, she's not the first person to ever say that Kamala Harris has a chameleon, you know, kind of aura or attitude. When she's speaking to South Asians, she'll say she, she, she identifies as this. When she's speaking to Nigerians, in quotes, she'll say she identifies as, Niger as a Nigerian. When she's speaking to, um, to black people, she identifies as a black person. So... I can imagine anybody who is everything to everybody, that person really doesn't stand for something. And that is something you should be worried about. Let it be that, okay, you are standing for this particular thing, whether or not people vote for you. And then you give people that choice to, okay, even though she stands for this, I support her because other, you know, um, uh, other you know policies aligned with my belief system or something give people a reason to stand for you stand for something yourself I think that is the issue most people have with Kamala Harris she sounds very enlightened she sounds like she knows what she's doing but when you look at it in a, in a larger scale you begin to question what she truly stands for you know you can't just be everything to everybody and I think that's the problem uh, Michaela Montgomery is having with Kamala Harris and I love how you, you see the thing I love how she stands for Trump but then she doesn't force people in conserve the culture to actually root for or to vote for Trump simply because she stands for Trump she's like I'm presenting to you the same opportunities that I that was presented to me like I'm giving you an opportunity to meet your candidates i'm giving you that opportunity to see the people you are about to vote for i'm giving you that opportunity to have a conversation with them and then after having these conversations after picking their brains after listening to what they have to say make a choice for yourself ask yourself not like you vote blindly not like you are supporting this person you know simply because another person is supporting this person make your own findings ask your own questions do your own research and be convinced and be sure that this is the same person you want to vote for i love what michaela is doing so far let me know what you think about this video let me know what you think about conserve the culture in general let me know your thoughts about america's first work and you know just drop me a comment in the comment section. Let me know if you're for Trump or you're for, Kam or you're for Kamala Harris. Uh, if you've gotten to this point in this video, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe to this channel, and of course, turn on your notification bells to get notified every single time I drop a new video. Till I come here next time, stay jiggy. I love you. Bye.